Uh, Ambassador Blyce, thanks very much for your time. Oh, thanks for having me. As, yeah. as you look at um, Australia and the quite colourful politics at the moment, are you surprised about the way things are unfolding given you look at the comparative economic strength of Australia to, say, the United States, Europe and elsewhere around the world? Oh, I think that politics are colourful everywhere. In fact, if you look around the world, almost every uh, uh, democracy is in minority coalition in the parliamentary system. In the U.S., there's some pretty colourful co politics going on right now. I think that's the nature of democracies, and it's, and it's a positive thing. It means that you have a, a rich engagement by uh, different points of view, and, and it always seems to work out in the end. You make that comparison with the United States, the president have to, having to deal with a a hostile Congress. Uh, are Americans more used to it than Australians, do you think? Well, I think uh, we've had a number of instances of divided government where you have a Congress from a different party than the president. And again, we've always managed to make progress even during those periods. It's a, uh, it, it tends to be a little testier and you tend to see more of the friction uh, in those situations. But uh, we've, we've had a tremendous amount of success in the past few years once you start tallying up the legislation that actually went through, whether it was health care, financial reform, nuclear nonproliferation, um, you know, resetting our relationships with other countries, uh, appointing of key personnel, including justices of the Supreme Court. So even with a divided um, uh, Congress, there is, there, there's opportunity for progress. Do, do you think that Australians, in the, in the midst of all of that colourful engagement on the political level, that uh, there is a sense that they don't, Australians don't realise how strong the economy is and how well the country is doing. No, I think, I think it's natural for democracies, particularly the US and Australia, which are always self-critical, uh, to underestimate how well they're doing. You know, what I say to people in, in Australia sometimes when I hear concerns about the, the, the strength of, of um, uh, Australia's economy or its direction is that, you know, when The Economist magazine puts a map of your country on the cover and paints it in gold, you know, you're doing okay. Uh, and the same thing with the United States. People worry about the U.S. economy, but we had 3% growth in the last quarter. We had, uh, you know, uh, two good months in a row on, uh, uh, you know, our unemployment rolls falling. Uh, we've had uh, steady progress for 22 months now in economic growth. And uh, we have a lot of money in cash with private sector prepared to be invested. So uh, while we always want the economy to be stronger, and as long as there are people who are unemployed, we need to work every day to get them jobs. Uh, but I also think we need occasionally to step back and look at the trends and understand that we're moving in the right direction. There's a lot of talk made in Australia about the importance of China, our, our biggest trading partner. But when you include investment, the relationship with the United States is, is far greater. It's a, a, a larger, more important economic relationship. Why is that not more known in Australia? Because, there, as I say, there's a lot made of the China relationship. Well, I'm obviously doing a poor job as ambassador. <laughs> that it, that's why it's not known. Uh, I really should talk more about uh, the maturity of our economic relations with Australia and with China and Australia's relationship with China as well, because there is a lot of curiosity about it and there's a lot of misinformation about it. Uh, you're, you're exactly right. The U.S. investment in Australia is 30 times that of China. Now, we think the relationship between China and Australia is an important one. We, we uh, encourage the economic relationship. We want to see both uh, of these nations succeeding economically, and we trade heavily with both of you. Uh, but in terms of who, uh, you know, the, the notion that the U.S. economic connection with Australia is weakening in any way, that's just wrong. If anything, it's never been stronger. And as I said, not only are we your number three trade partner, but we are far and away your largest investor. And one real measure of um, who you're betting on in the world is where you invest your money. And we're obviously in betting very, very heavily on Australia. China is one um, element of the relationship, uh, the Australia-US relationship, that needs to also be absorbed, uh, the growing power and economic uh, power and strategic power of, uh, of China. Uh, how do the, the more bullish comments from the Republican candidates, for example, and the presidential uh, primaries, does that add a, a complexity to that, do you think? Oh, I think that, again, the U.S.-China relationship is very sophisticated and mature. 
None of us get too wound up by statements that are made in the heat of a political campaign or made by an individual in connection with a, a particular event or particular day. What we really look to is this ongoing dialogue that we're having constantly. Uh, we have these strategic and economic dialogues with China where we cover you know, 100, 140 different issues, and we have um, you know, teams of diplomats working together day in, day out, and we, we do have a good understanding of one another's interests and objectives. And where we don't have a clear insight, we're working very hard to, to increase the transparency and, and make sure that we do understand each other's intentions and capabilities. So no one gets too distracted by the, by the stray comments. Maybe, maybe people in the media love to pick up on those. Uh, but when you're doing serious diplomatic business with one another, you're able to filter that, that kind of uh, uh, distraction out. We saw the President's speech to, to Parliament last year, the mm-hmm. focus on the, the well, Asia-Pacific. Yeah, in that context, what are the implications the for this part of the world uh, from the, the presidential the election race of November, November this year? Well, I think the, the strategic implications were exactly as the, as the President laid them out, which is that as you look around the world, uh, this is the center of gravity for economic growth and also demographic change. It's a, it's a tremendously vibrant, important, vital area of the world, and we need to increase our focus on it. So we have talked about the refocus. Uh, we've always been a Pacific nation. Uh, we have heavily invested for seven decades in strengthening this region, and we never, we never turned away from it. But I think now we're, we're re-energizing and, and increasing the tempo of our focus um, so that uh, you know, we're going to ensure that there's continued peace, prosperity, growth, and all the things that we invested in before are continued into the future. The, um, uh, the implications for our political debate is I, I think that there is bipartisan consensus on this. When you look at the reaction within uh, Parliament, when you look at the reaction within Congress, uh, either to the president's visit or to uh, the prime minister's visit to Congress, uh, it crossed party lines. Uh, we are we are fully invested in this region, in this approach, and in one another. You, you spoke earlier about the green shoots in the, the U.S. economy, unemployment's fallen um, over yeah. over recent months, and President Obama's ahead in the latest uh, Washington uh, Post opinion poll. Do you think he's now the favorite? He was ahead in that hypothetical matchup with Romney. Yeah, well, you know, as, as you probably know from talking to other diplomats, you have to generally be a little partisan to get these jobs, and you have to be nonpartisan to keep them. <laughs> so once the political season begins, I tend to keep my predictions to myself. But uh, I, I do think that uh, certainly the economy is always a factor in every U.S. election, and both sides are looking very carefully at uh, how what economic trends are occurring, and uh, you'll probably hear more and more discussion about those as we get closer to an election in November. On a, a couple of other issues, you'll, you'll be attending the, um, the 70th anniversary of the Darwin bombing, the, yes. the commemorations. Do the wartime experiences uh, between the United States and uh, Australia, do, do they have the same resonance, do you think, in the current generation? I think they do. In fact, I, um, I, I'm constantly impressed and uh, inspired when I go to these events, whether it is Anzac Day or commemoration of the Coral Sea, or having now gone uh, a, a few times to the Darwin commemoration, to see that it's um, it crosses all generations, and there is a a great honoring of sacrifice, uh, particularly in this country. Um, we see it with Veterans Day and Memorial Day back in the United States, but um, uh, it, it there's a special genuine quality to it here. Uh, I don't think that our relationship could be sustained alone, though, just on the um, wartime bond that, that was created. It's a much deeper, richer relationship, and every generation brings something new to this relationship, you know, more economic connection, more cultural connections, deeper understanding of each other's values, uh, and just friendship, just, you know, pure, uninhibited mateship. Uh, that occurs. Those are those are the things that have grown from that from that original experience 70 years ago. But um, 
uh, we have we haven't lost the thread on on that sacrifice and how much it meant, and that we all stand today in free countries um, uh, because of the uh, the people who were willing to lay down their lives seventy years ago. So this is the oak that uh, Eleanor Roosevelt planted. Yeah, and she's um, you know you think about what it took in 1943 mm-hmm. for her to come out here mm-hmm. in the middle of the war. Um, and also just what it took to, you know, to construct this in the middle of the war. I mean, they, they put the cornerstone down in 1942 when there hadn't been a single Allied victory in, wow. uh, in the Pacific. And it was just a statement that, you know, we're here to stay. And, you know, this Australia and the U.S., we're, we're, in, we're in this together. And, you know, we spoke about the, that commemoration in Darwin and that yeah. you're attending in a few weeks. And this... Yeah. This is a, a very physical reminder of that, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's you know, one tree, but it yeah. says a lot. No, it really is. I mean, you look at how, how big and strong this tree is now. It's, uh, and it's always, in the mornings, it's full of uh, kookaburros and cockatoos and um, crimson rosellas and king parrots. I mean, it's just, uh, it really, it's, it's just magnificent. And it, that's a tradition which... Um, the, the, the tree planting tradition yeah. began with this one with, planted with by that tree. Roosevelt, but then it's continued through to President Obama's. Yes, uh, President it? Obama's tree is over there, and um, we have a lot of um, U.S. presidents have planted trees here. So this is the one we just planted with uh, President Obama. And when we were planting it, I was explaining to him, because he said, oh, this is a nice tree. Yeah. And I said, well, you know, we actually planted it when he was supposed to be here a year earlier, and it wasn't looking that nice. It was looking like that Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Yeah. It's kind of <laughs> bent over and had only one leaf on top. <laughs> and uh, so it was almost good that we had an extra year before it came out, because it really grew up nicely. It's looking very healthy. Yep, yeah. yep. It was a brief stay, but he uh, enjoyed it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, it was... Um, he was here over two days, and, and what we packed in, you know, mm. two cities, lots of work, but also just a really good feeling yeah. everywhere he went. And he and I flew from Canberra to Darwin afterward, and he was just in a terrific mood. We spent yeah. most of the time just, you know, catching up in the, uh, there's a conference room on Air Force One. Yeah. And um, he was just, uh, as I said, in a, in a really, really upbeat mood just about the trip and uh, he loves Australia. He's, he's anxious to come back. One of the seminal moments I think of the trip was in that uh, hangar when he said, uh, Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. <laughs> <laughs> it was hilarious. Yeah, and the oi, oi, was oi was idea? perfect. No, actually he had raised it. He said, I was going to say Aussie, 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 but did they only do that at soccer games or could I do it here? I'm like, I think it'll go over here too. Perfect. And so he did it and uh, I've never heard such a precise oi, oi, oi. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. <laughs> <laughs> For you personally, what's next on your agenda? If you're offered the, the posting again <laughs> beyond next year's uh, inauguration, if President Obama continues, oh. if he's successful, would you stay? Oh, well, I'm, you know, I've told the president um, directly that, you know, my responsibility is to serve my country and I'll serve in uh, whatever capacity he believes uh, would be most appropriate for him. Um, but at the same time, I love this country. I love this post. I feel privileged every day to have the opportunity to work here. And, um, uh, you know, he's going to have to pry me out of the embassy. And I've got some Marines here, so, you know. <laughs> but but uh, at, the, at the end of the day, um, this is about public service. And I, um, uh, I feel very privileged to, to serve the U.S.-Australia relationship every day that I'm given the opportunity to do it. Would you ever consider a, a political career seeking office yourself? Well, you know, my wife has said that uh, she'd, she'd encourage me to do that with my second wife. So <laughs> she hopes my second wife would enjoy that. But uh, I think <laughs> I, 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 one of the nice things about having an appointed position is that it does give you the chance to serve your country, uh, but not necessarily put your family through some of the really difficult challenges uh, that, that elected office demands. And so I admire the people yeah, who run the for elected life. office, yeah. uh, but I don't, I don't, I don't see myself being one of them. So you, you get to have a life as well. Relevance, yeah, uh, yeah, you really do. And thanks for having us and showing us around. No, no, thank you. Thanks for uh, for coming by. And you know, anytime you want, we'll we'll you know leave a light on for you.